Welcome to the pre-lab video for Aspirin Part 3 Spectrophotometric Analysis. This experiment is part of the General Chemistry 2 sequence at York College of Pennsylvania. This is the third part of our three-week aspirin experiment and the goal of our final work is to quantify the purity of our experimentally made samples of aspirin. And to do so, we're going to use ultraviolet visible spectroscopy, UV-Vis spectroscopy. Now, this is a technique that we have used before in uh, general chemistry here at York College. Uh, earlier in chemistry 2, we used UV-Vis spectroscopy to record the absorbance of crystal violet solutions uh, when we were performing our kinetics experiment. And in chemistry 1, perhaps, you might re recall using... Uh, UV-Vis spectroscopy to determine the content of iron in a vitamin or in two different vitamin samples. In all three cases, this week's experiment and the two previous ones, uh, we're using what's known as Beer's Law uh, in this analysis. Beer's Law says that the amount of light absorbed by a solution, so the absorbance of the solution, is equal to the concentration of your chemical of interest in that solution times a constant. Now that constant is actually the product of two other things. Um, how Literally how wide your sample is in, in terms of the cuvette that you use in the uh, spectrometer, but then also an intrinsic property of the chemical itself. We can just group those two together and call them a constant. Uh, and so this becomes A, the absorbance, equals B, the constant actually, times C, the concentration of your analyte, what you're trying to analyze. Now A equals BC is very similar to Y equals MX plus B, a graph, a, a straight line. And so where the Y could be the absorbance of the chemical, the X would be the concentration and then M would take the place of B, the slope in this case. Now the y-intercept B of your general form of a line would normally be zero in a Beer's Law analysis because a chemical uh, at zero concentration should have zero absorbance. But experimentally it might be just a touch off of zero. Okay. So we're going to use the iron-3 chloride test that you may recall from aspirin part 2 and then be able to quantify it with UV-Vis spectroscopy. So if you remember from your aspirin part 2, when we have salicylic acid or salicylate ions, in the presence of iron, which we introduce from iron 3 chloride, we form a complex. So we can see that the iron here is able to attach. It's got a plus 2 charge it's able to attach to the two minus charges here on the salicylate dianion. This complex now had that deep purple color that you might recall from lab last week. And the greater the amount of salicylic acid present, the stronger that purple color. So these were some pictures that I had for the previous pre-lab exercise. This first sample was pure salicylic acid, all right? Um, and this one over here would have been uh, representative of your uh, one of your products where you had a much smaller concentration of salicylic acid. And then this middle case was our pure acetyl salicylic acid where to our eye, we don't see any of that purple. One of the interesting things about the UV-Vis spectroscopy is it is much more sensitive at detecting this, you know, this purple color or any color for that matter than our eye. So we might be able to see very small amounts of impurity in what to our eye looks like a rather pure sample. So last week we did this iron 3 chloride test qualitatively and we were just able to discern visually, oh, this first sample looks pretty pure because we don't see purple. This sample looks impure because we do see purple. Today, or in this week's experiment, you'll be able to put a number onto how much uh, salicylic acid specifically is in each of these based on your standards that you will prepare. 
So you'll prepare a series of salicylic acid standards. You'll start with a very strong concentrated version like this deep purple one, and then you'll dilute it down and record the absorbance of each of those known concentrations. This is very similar to what would have been done in uh, the iron content experiment. Uh, so this leads us to pre-lab question two, actually. In the lab today, you will prepare, like I said, a series of known concentrations of salicylic acid in iron three chloride. And then you can use the spectrometer to measure the absorbance, how much light is each one of those solutions absorbing. Of course, the more concentrated, as you can see in these data sets, the more concentrated your um, solution, the more uh, light it's going to absorb. Now we can make a graph of this data. And this is what you're asked to do in pre-lab question two, where we want to put the absorbance on the y-axis and the concentration on the x-axis. And so you should use Excel to make this graph and add the trend line. And we don't just want to put the line through the data points, we actually want to add the equation of it because that's going to be very important, not just for pre-lab question three, but also for our data analysis. What this line is going to allow us to do is to record the absorbance of solutions that we do not know their concentration. So in other words, if I scroll back up to this unknown that we just qualitatively looked at last week and said, oh yeah, it looks like there is some salicylic acid in it. If we put this solution into our spectrometer and record now an absorbance for that solution, we can use this equation to determine the concentration, the X, the concentration of that solution. So how much salicylic acid is present in it? That will then then allow us to determine how much acetyl salicylic acid or aspirin is present in the solution as well, thus giving us the purity of our sample. So uh, what you would be doing uh, in pre-lab question two is using the data, as I said, putting these values for absorbance on the y-axis and the values for concentration on the x. Add the trend line showing the equations uh, the equation, sorry, and the R squared. Always useful to see the R squared just to know how good your data set is, how much confidence you should have in any further results that you calculate out of it. Question three then says, all right, let's mathematically use the equation of that trend line to solve for the concentration of a solute when we know the absorbance. So this is this will be one of the first steps of our data analysis in lab after we generate our uh, graph from our standards. So in this case, in the pre-lab question, if the absorbance is 3.32, we are going to set y equal to 0.32. So we're saying the absorbance of any of these solutions is equal to 6.2 times the concentration of the solution minus 0 0.008. So I plug in my 0.32 and then I simply complete the algebra. I would add 0.008 to the left side of this equation. And then to finish, I would divide by 0.62, or 6.2, sorry. And I trust that you'll be able to complete that last bit and come up with the concentration of the uh, solute in this particular case. So in your lab, after you gra graph your standards, you'll be able to measure the absorbance of your unknown solutions which will be several of them. You'll have your uh, recrystallized aspirin sample. You'll have your uh, raw aspirin sample. And then we might ask you to uh, examine a couple of other solutions as well. Uh, the new store-bought aspirin and then some old aspirin, just as you did in the qualitative uh, parts last week. So you'll record those four absorbances and for each one of them, you'll want to determine the concentration of salicylic acid that's in that. Now in lab, you'll have to go a little bit further. You'll need to take that concentration and turn it into a mass. So how many grams of salicylic acid are present in that sample? Okay. So if you began with one gram, for example, and you determined that there was 0.1 grams 
of salicylic acid present, you would subtract that 0.1 gram and then would have determined that the remaining 0.9 grams are aspirin. Thus, the purity of aspirin is going to be the 0.9 grams of aspirin divided by the 1 gram of sample in its entirety, or 90% purity. Okay, And so I'll be conducting uh, or making a second uh, video to help you with the data analysis and how to put together your entire three-week sequence of uh, results and findings from your aspirin experiment into the one large report. So I'll show you how to do some of that in the, in the next uh, video that I'll make available to you. Okay. The uh, only other pre-lab question that you had for this week uh, sort of relates to salicylic acid and acetyl salicylic acid. Um, and, and part of your research to set the stage for your formal report, you should look up some information on these two materials. What you started with, acetyl salicylic, or sorry, salicylic acid, that's what you started with at the beginning of uh, part one of this process, and acetyl salicylic acid, what we hope we've made and then analyzed over the last couple of weeks. To be honest, both of them have been and can be used as pain medications, but uh, nowadays we prefer aspirin, acetyl salicylic acid. And so we hope you'll find some information that uh, you know explains why that is the case. And it's a simple matter of the structure of the two compounds. If I go back up to the salicylate dianion structure, um, this compound uh, is a little bit rough on your stomach, it turns out. Uh, it's a much stronger acid. And so I know we're talking a little bit about acids and bases in, uh, in lecture. And so this is a stronger acid, and thus it might be a little more irritating to, uh, to one's stomach. And that'll vary from person to person, but on average, this is more likely to cause some stomach pain, even though it might take care of your headache or, or whatever aches and pains you have otherwise. When we convert this to aspirin, remember, we're adding a chunk to this O minus up here. And that chunk is uh, actually creating a buffer or it's buffering. Thus, the one of the first commercial aspirins to be made was called bufferin because they literally buffered the salicylic acid. And so that's reducing the acid strength, but yet it's retaining the medicinal property of the compound. So that was kind of a nice benefit uh, that uh, one of the early chemists who studied this was able to find. So hopefully you'll find that in some of your basic background research and be able to add that into your laboratory as part of the introductory materials that you would report. Okay. So again, to summarize, what you're going to do in this experiment is prepare a series of standards of salicylic acid in, uh, with the iron-3 chloride. You will record the absorbance of each of those standards. You'll have to first determine at what wavelength, so we'll allow you to scan from four to 700 nanometers. And you should see the peak absorbance somewhere in that range. And then you'll set your spectrometer specifically to that wavelength, the peak wavelength, to record these uh, absorbances. That'll speed up the process then so that you won't have to take a minute or two to record the entire scan. You can just uh, put the uh, cuvettes directly into the spectrometer and record the absorbance at the one target wavelength. Then as part of your data analysis, you'll graph those standards, like uh, our Beer's Law analysis here. You'll determine the equation that matches the absorbance to the uh, concentrations of your solutions. And from there, you'll be determining the concentrations, working backwards then, of the unknown solutions, your experimental aspirins and the store-bought and old samples of aspirin. Okay? At the end of the lab, you should have a percentage purity for your aspirin that you can then compare as part of a larger discussion in the overall report for this experiment to the qualitative data and to your notes that hopefully you've been taking all along on how your samples look uh, and what you can uh, visually tell from comparing your sample to uh, the samples, uh, the store-bought samples of aspirin. Okay?
Be sure to ask questions if you have them as you go along. Uh, but I think most of the skills that you'll be utilizing in the lab are ones that you have uh, uh, built before. So this is a great test of your previous uh, chemistry experiment. But of course, your instructor and laboratory assistant are there to help you uh, and make sure that you uh, conduct the experiment safely. There really aren't any safety hazards or concerns to be worried about in this week's uh, lab. All of the solutions that you're creating can go down the drain in this lab uh, because we're working in water. Everything is safe to go down the drain with plenty of water just to rinse so that we're not purging a ton of purple dyes down the drain at one time. So, so be sure that you run uh, plenty of water down the sink with your waste at the end of today's lab. All right. Good luck in the experiment, and I hope you find a, a good purity for your recrystallized sample. Your raw samples might not be as pure, but hopefully your data at this point has uh, already given you a pretty good indication of that.